Okay, how many of you are the cats that get herded? Raise your hand if you're a cat that gets herded sometimes. All right, now raise your hand if you are the cat herder. Oh my God. All right, we are gonna bring up our panel of cat herders. Come on up, guys. And this panel is Herding Cats and Cultivating Campmates, Lessons and Acculturation. Here is your moderator, Mr. Josh Lees, who's gonna introduce all of your panelists. Let's give them a round of applause. Stuart, everybody. Hey, welcome to How to Herd Cats and Cultivate Campmates, Lessons in Acculturation. Very fancy. I'm Josh Lees, I'm Program Development Manager at Burning Man. Uh, my original theme camp affiliation is with Burning Sky, and today I, uh, thank you, you guys like the Sky Fuckers, they're a good group. Today I uh, manage Everywhere Pavilion on Playa with its work camp elsewhere and I volunteer for GATE and on the survey crew. During the year, I manage the fiscal sponsorship program, uh, which Breedlove spoke about, and the fellowship program at Burning Man. So as theme camp leaders, we struggle with similar questions. How do we acculturate new camp members? How do we cultivate consistent core camp membership year over year? How do we make sure camp members are participating and more to the point, contributing equally? Is it possible to hire that mythical cowboy to help us with cat herding? Perhaps all of that and more will be touched on. Probably not, we have 30 minutes, it's not much. <laughs> and we have five speakers and they're all really, really interesting. So this is just to start the conversation. I invite you all to chat with us afterwards and throughout the day. So first, I'd like to introduce Erica, AKA Queen Pin, who's the primary cat herder, treasurer, and co-lead at Skinny Kitty Tea House. Uh, burning and camping with Skinny Kitty Tea House since 2009, she jumped into the role of meeting planner and secretary in 2011, has been in her current role for the past six years. This will be a decade on playa for Queen Pin. Skinny Kitty is home to about 150 campers, and depending on what day you stop by, is a tea house with a piano and a performance space, and they also have one raging party. Uh, Noah, aka Belmont, is the camp lead of Cult of the Magic Lady, a 10-year ranger and former conclave performer. He's been juggling on ply volunteer work with camp leadership and personal time since 2005. Originally a neighborhood of camps and friends calling themselves Foxy Coconut and a rad woman named Magic Lady uh, who answered all of their prayers. Uh, over the years, the camps were added to the neighborhood and the cult of the Magic Lady was born about three years back. Andy, AKA Boy Scout, is a founder of Aqua Zone, Oasis, and Love Water Bar. Burning since 2002, he and two friends founded AquaZone Healing Oasis and Love Water Bar in, 20, in 2005, a small family-style camp with up to 50 campers any particular year, an alumni network in the hundreds, and active campers from all over Europe and the United States. They're proud to routinely have three generations of one family represented in their camp. Uh, they provide uh, a water bar, shocking, and uh, a Reiki sacred space and chiropractic dome and art cars. Uh, they have a casual village with Burns Without Borders, Burning Roadshow, and Sonic Runway, among others in the past. And uh, Boy Scouts experience includes technical station manager for BMIR from 2001 to 2013, volunteer recruiter for Burns Without Borders in Biloxi, BM Tech Web, and uh, crew member for the Sonic Runway. It's really impressive. Uh, Lee, Camp Epic. Uh, Lee first arrived on play in 2011 after a friend offered to pay for his ticket and expenses. It's a full scholarship. Uh, then, uh, so they bought tickets a week before and arrived with, armed with 600 glow sticks that were hard to, as gifts. Uh, apparently it was hard to get, they were hard to get rid of. And, um, he came across a bunch of, he came across Sacred Spaces Village and was mesmerized by theme camps and their unsustainability. So he decided that after his, after his first temple burn that he would build a camp uh, focused on sustainability and the next year he brought out 16 people, which turned out to be disastrous. <laughs> and then he, when he realized he needed to bring out people who should be there rather than people who could afford to be there. 
And the following year, he brought 25, and today the camp is capped at 150 residents and has grown into a platform that enables its members to concentrate on gifting rather than on surviving the burn. Uh, Jill, sneaky just a little, is the camp president and interactivity lead from Camp Orphan Endorphin. A uh, Black Rock City citizen since 2012, a very interesting personal journey took Jill and five of her friends on the adventure of a lifetime. They were provided all the information they could need and more from the members of Orphan Endorphin. Spreadsheet, supply list, space to camp and RV for her pregnant self. She has been with uh, Orphan Endorphin ever since. As an interactivity lead, she encourages all levels of participation helps to create space for ideas and work with camp elders to manage layout and gaming space based on campers needs. Uh, Orphan Endorphin is an amazing experience uh, of burning in a community while, self, while being self-reliant. She also enjoys burns, uh, regional burns, where she has the opportunity to relax. Very impressive group. Uh, I mean, you're all very impressive, so. Next, the session. This is the start of a conversation. So we have a couple of prompts and we'll take some uh, questions as well. So the first prompt is, uh, how do you cultivate new campers, get them involved and keep them involved? Uh, who is the, let me leave Noah and Jill. We're gonna start this on this. Thing, uh, oh, it is on, hey, that's great. Okay, so hi, I'm Noah. I am the lead of essentially two camps, uh, one camp within another, which is kind of interesting in that leads to some differences in acculturation depending on where people are. I'm gonna focus actually on my smaller camp um, as far as what we do to keep people or to bring people in. Um, one of the big things we actually use is I wrote a manual, uh, tw uh, 24 pages long, that was just all the stuff new people kept asking me. Um, it sounds a little silly to be like, hey, wanna come to Burning Man? Do your homework. But the truth is it actually worked um, because suddenly campers come in knowing what the expectations are. So instead of, hey, I want to come to Burning Man, what do I do? I have people read the manual, come up to me and go, hey, um, I, I think I know which department I want to volunteer for as an opener. In fact, the way to get into our camp is number one, pick a department that you are now in charge of, and number two, find a sponsor in our camp who absolutely uh, believes that you're going to do everything. Because the way sponsorship works is not, hey, she's pretty cool, you guys. You should let her in the camp. Sponsorship is anything she doesn't do is now my responsibility. So suddenly, instead of going, oh, I like this person, it's are you actually going to contribute? Which works great. We started this system after one year we affectionately refer to as our hell year. Um, when the camp next to us exploded, literally, that was a hell of a twister. Um, and we brought in accidentally 10 more people in our camp than we realized. Um, so now we use this concept of, first of all, when you come in to get into our camp, you're telling us how you're gonna contribute, and second of all, you know what your expectations are. Um, and that concept actually of the departments, I divide up everything that I can get someone else to do into departments. We have a finance department, we have an infrastructure department, we have a shelter department, transport department, scheduling. They're not actually that hard. It's not that much work, but everybody is doing them and we have teams of two or three on each one and it's literally, yeah, that's you. So if you're shelter department and you screw this up, we're not gonna have a shelter. Now, of course I do double check, but I don't come in and do it for them. As such, my camp has 100% participation. Everybody is working for the camp and everybody comes into Burning Man with this idea of, you know what, I'm here to do something. The result is actually more than just that we get our camp done with all the labor distributed, but it's also people come into the, to Burning Man as a culture with this idea of, I'm here to do something. So I have new people come in and just say, hey, uh, I got my department stuff done. I, I wanna do something for the burn. I have this weird idea. Last year, I had a virgin come up to me and go, hey, I have this really weird idea. Would it be cool if like, I gave everybody unicorn horns and made them do a bar crawl and just like randomly got people to do it? And I was like, yeah, let me tell you about the what, where, when. And that's it. That's all the work I had to do was inform her of how the what, where, when worked so that she could like put that thing in there. And then she did a unicorn themed bar crawl. Cool. So that's basically how we do acculturation. A manual, make ownership, and have people coming in saying, what am I gonna do? Uh, Noah, we had, uh, it took me five years to do the uh, guide, but yeah, we had the same thing. 
and everybody's forced to do something. Uh, but actually, since Burning Man is a gifting festival, I try to make my virgins do almost nothing on their first year. So we tell them, come to camp. And when they say, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to do this, I'm like, okay, that's great, but you don't really understand what Burning Man is about. Just come. We will gift everything to you. Everybody else who's already not a virgin in camp will do your work for you. It's okay. We want you to go out of the playa, enjoy it as much as you can. And on year two, when you're overwhelmed with gifts, then come ready to give back. Um, so we do the same thing. We just delay it by a year. So to talk, of acculturation, to talk about acculturation, I think it's important to understand the definition, which is the transfer of values and customs. And it's a two-way street. So when you have a camp of 10 people and you bring a virgin, it's easy. They're immersed with a bunch of burners, and they're inevitably going to become a burner, even if you do nothing. It will just happen. But if you're a camp of 100 and all of a sudden you bring 40 virgins, not only do the 40 virgins learn what being a burner is about, but the 50 burners or 60 burners or 100 are affected by the virgins and they deteriorate. So <laughs> they both. Yeah, this happens at Burning Man too. When you have too many virgins, it deteriorates the, the fabric and it's a two-way street. So that takes a lot more work, which I divided into four steps. It's educate, memorize, inspire, sift, and then you repeat all four of a year. So to educate, you show them the 10 principles and you drill them into them. Anybody who comes to camp, you say you have to read these 10 principles and we have our own camp principles. Um, not everybody does equal work, but everybody has to be a net positive. That's our main principle in camp, which means everybody will have their moments of being not a good human, let alone a good burner. And it's okay if the following day or the day before they made up for it to the point where when you add all their aggregate behavior, you get something positive. I don't expect you to be amazing all the time, but you should be a, a positive average. So memorize, educate them on what Burning Man Inner Camp is about and then help them understand it. Uh, for them to understand it, it has to make sense. I can't just say, here are the 10 principles. One of them is gifting. You should gift. Much like any kid, they would ask, but why? So I have to make sense of it. If I ask you to memorize the following colors, uh, like blue, baby blue, orange, pink, red, yellow, and I ask all of you tomorrow, can you repeat that to me? Very few of you will be able to repeat in that order. But if I tell you, give me all the colors that you see in a playa sunrise in order, you would give me something close to that list. So if you make a story out of it and you make sense out of it, they will be able to memorize it. So after you do that, you help them understand why it's important by inspiring them. You take them in the first year, you say, here's the playa, and all of a sudden they realize, wow, if 60,000 people follow these 10 principles, this happens. And all of you know, which is why you're here, how inspiring and amazing that is. Once they do that, some of them will get it right away. Some of them won't. Um, and that's where the sifting process is. The ones that don't, I don't have to sift out the bad ones. I have to sift in the good ones. The ones that don't get it will naturally not want to come back. Some of them I see potential with and I force them to come back in various <laughs> ways. Um, one of those people was my mom. Uh, on her first year, she was overwhelmed by the dust and everything else that there is to be overwhelmed by. But on her second year, when she finished it, she vouched to never miss a burn. So sometimes you have to re put some effort into it. But the sifting, the sifting of the ones that don't will just die off. They will leave. And the ones who are good will stay. So that way your camp will just become better and better and better. And the 50-50 split will turn into 90-10. And at some point, you'll be so full that you won't know you'll come across a tough decision of which virgins do you tell them, sorry, we don't have rooms. Once you reach that point, you know you have a good acculturation in your camp. Um, for specifics, you can meet me later, but the guide and other methods are extremely effective. That's about it. Thanks, Lee. Hi, I'm Jill Sneaky, just a little from the Orphan and Dorphin Camp and also the Theme Camp Organizers Facebook page. Uh, in our camp, we deal with orphans all the time. 
Uh, we can have up to 135 campers at three different styles of camp with different levels of interaction and acculturation. One of the things that we found that works really well for us is our premeditated uh, selection of campers, so sponsorship, but also just seeing what their intentions are going to be, dividing them into the teams with their registration, and then working with them as far as if they're all coming from the Europe area, having a elder person from our camp work with them, have webinars with them, and conference calls with them in their time zone, which creates a group before they travel, because there's a lot of unique um, things that happen when you're trying to come from other countries that here domestically we're really not going to understand and so we have that capability that we bring an elder to them and so they are part of the camp from the moment that they register and so our acculturation process starts with a recommendation to become part of the camp but also meeting the needs of the camper thank you so that was a great segue into our next question uh, Theme camps aren't just local anymore, they're national, they're international. I ran into someone in Israel who was with Dome on the Range just randomly, it was really interesting. So how do you keep remote people, like those watching on Facebook right now, uh, engaged? So uh, funny you should mention Facebook. Um, Skinny Kitty is, uh, is a camp of about 150 people and we're based in Mendocino County um, and I'd say about a quarter of our campers live in Mendocino County and we've got people, you know, in the Bay Area, in Oregon, Colorado, they're, uh, you know, we, we're all over the place. And uh, one of the things that we sort of like accidentally stumbled upon is uh, doing the Facebook Live uh, streams of our meeting, of our meetings. It's really hard to get people even from the Bay Area to drive up two hours north for our meetings. So, um, and we have a, a secret Facebook group that all of our campers are in. And when you do the, when you are on the page, you can start a live video from the, um, from the secret page so that you're just broadcasting to your campmates and not, you know, the entire world, your, your uh, meeting. Um, and it's worked fantastically. We had tried Skype and, and um, conference calls and stuff like that, which just is, was, uh, you know, hard to, you know, hard to actually get working. And the Facebook live feeds are great because people can comment when you're talking about something that they can, you know, put a comment in there to answer a question or, or ask a question themselves. And whoever's doing the filming can then, you know, repeat it to the group and it's worked really well. Um, so that's one of the ways that we get, you know, remote people involved in the meetings. Um, we also, uh, we have crews, we require everybody to be on a crew, and we have specific crews that uh, are, that we encourage people from out of the area to join, because obviously they can't load up before, you know, beforehand or do all the things that need to happen on the ground. So we'll have them do like Leave No Trace crew or, you know, some of the crews that are specific to on Playa. Um, and then we are a tea house, we serve tea 24-7. And so that's actually one of the best ways that we have found to get people involved on the playa because as soon as you step behind the tea bar and start, you know, meeting people and, and uh, serving tea, that's really been one of the best ways to get, uh, you know, new people involved in our camp, meeting people, meeting our neighbors and, and that sort of thing. So we actually haven't made it mandatory that everyone uh, uh, takes a shift behind the T-bar, but we're actually thinking about doing that this year because we think it's a really great way for, for people to uh, get involved on the plan. Thanks, Clinton. Um, I'm Boy Scout, I'm with the Aqua Zone, and um, about a th we're a family camp, we're less than 50 people. Um, with, with more than 50 people, you really don't know everybody else. And so, you know, your, your manual, we have a, um, I have a, a participation expectations um, sheet that everybody, everybody who signs up has to sign up, it reads it and, and, and commit to it. Uh, so we really have set expectations um, on that. And I, and I really stressed participation in as a duocracy rather than the financial. The financials, they tend to work out. We're not, you know, we're all adults. Some of us are flush, some are not. Um, so we really have a sliding scale and, and towards that ways. Um, to join our camp, we, you know, 
first thing is I get spammed every year. Oh, I've, you know, we're, we're from here, we're from there. And, you know, and it's only the ones that say what they love about water. Because that's, that's, that's my camp. It's, it's all about water. If, if they don't even talk about water, oh, we want to join your camp. We really think it's fun. You know, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, it, you know, and, and then, you know, it's like, okay, what can you do for the camp? How do you want to participate? We really stress participation, as I said. If they, you know, they're, they're remote. We've had people from Germany, from Poland, from Italy, from so on. The, and so they, they can participate in many different ways. We have on, on Playa, and, but off Playa, you know, they can do crafting. You can, you can fold, you know, a hundred feet of flags into your luggage or, um, or, you know, bring an art car. My dad comes from Kentucky. He brings an art car, um, <laughs> you know, um, it, in, you know, banners. I've had, you know, street signs shipped to me from LA because they, you know, they wanted to participate. I'm like, oh, here's a template. And, you can, you know, um, you can spray paint some street signs for us. So we really, you know, work both on playa and off playa participation. But, you know, there's no plus ones. Everyone is joining our family. So, oh, me and my girlfriend, I'm like, what's her name? <laughs> um, and, and last but not least, we, this is it's a hard lesson to learn because we, we really have an open heart, but there's no latecomers. Everyone that's ever joined up in the last, you know, three weeks, oh, we want to go to Burning Man. It's like they invariably don't participate. We've been disappointed with that. So we really just have a hard shut off date, hard cut off date on, on the roster. And, you know, and we use Google, Google Docs and Google Groups. And, and, and there's, it's a conversation that people are saying, there's too many emails. I'm like, there's a lot of voices and they all want to be heard and they all have something to say. And, so that's that's how we get remote people to come in, um, and 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 they and if they don't participate, they usually you know they don't show up the next year. And I'm, I'm, now I'm having problems with people saying, you know, I've been with your camp for five years, and we can't do it this year. We just don't have the energy for it, and, I'm, and so we're we have to recalibrate a little bit. But um, you know, it, everyone has to. I really insist uh, and stress on. What are you going to do with the camp? So. Thanks, Boy Scout. <laughs> so we have just under 10 minutes for questions. Oh. Oh, great. Oh. We're going to questions. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Got a question here. Um, so. I feel really confident in my ability to acculturate new camp members. I have a background in education. I've been running camps for the last three years, ever since I started doing Burning Man. Um, my main problem that I'm running into is acculturating my leadership because they have these roles of authority. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. I'm glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> um, the newbies are really easy for me because they're excited and they're impressionable and they're open to new experiences, which is really great. But it's my leadership that is really the challenge. It's a matter of how to get everybody who is in a role of authority to buy in, I guess. And like, I enjoy that process, but I think that for me is my biggest challenge is how to make sure that all my leaders within my theme camp are on the same page without, you know, pushing too many buttons or turning too many people out. And there's big personalities, right, that help run everything. We all have big personalities. How do you manage that within your camps, especially those of you who have camps within camps? Because that's what I'm dealing with. <laughs> so herding stubborn, crusty kittens, how do you? Really, I thought those were the cats that we were herding was our leadership cats. I didn't think, you know, we don't really have a lot of problems with uh, the new burners. So in Orphan Endorphin, uh, Captain Ron and I have developed a system where we acculturate through the process of leadership. So you start as an orphan and people send us people from all over the world to learn how to be a burner. Once you've been your orphan, you go through the graduation process that you can see here Saturday at high noon. All are welcome to watch. Um, 
And then we go into leadership and teams. We want you to take on the team. So we go one step further. Last year you were on a team. This year you're going, the next year you learn the team. You are the leader of the team. You are responsible for the functions of the team. If you kick ass, please come and be our camp lead. We don't want to have to talk to everybody about everything every year. I'd like to burn too. Wouldn't you like to burn? <sighs> Jeez, this is not our problem every year. And so then we invite people to be the camp leads. And those camp leads are under the tutelage of the elders. Once you are an elder, you have stepped back and you are offering services. You are offering this way the camp grows, changes, and is always vibrant. Because if you are stuck in your leadership role and you do not want to give up control, then the camp can't grow, change, morph with the new campers. And so we utilize that method to help train regional burners that are running regionals around the world now. Um, so you, since you specifically talked about camps with other camps inside, um, so what we're doing actually, um, I'm an old union stagehand. Um, I'm an audio engineer if anyone wants to talk about sound complaints later. Um, and union style management, at least within the theater, was always, today you're in charge, tomorrow you're not. I could be the A1, so the lead audio position, one day, the next day I come in and the person I was telling what to do yesterday is now in charge and telling me what to do. We essentially do a similar concept in my camp. So with those departments, I don't have a department head exactly, but there's like the more experienced person probably knows more. They come in and I'm telling them straight off, your job is not to boss people around, your job is to train every single other person, which is like two people, um, in what to do, so that all of them can be in charge, and next year you're gonna do something different. This means if you're coming in like, I wanna be the boss of things, yeah, too bad, there isn't a boss of things. We don't have that. Um, even as the camp lead, I am doing everything in my power to push what I am doing to other people. You're in charge of this, you're in charge of this, you're in charge of this. The only thing I'm doing is the thing that I can't delegate out to someone else. And when people want to be camp lead, and I've had a few people come up to me and say, hey, I want to lead the camp next year. And I go, okay, I've built this intern camp lead position, also known as the redundancy department. Your job is to check everybody else and make sure that they have what they need to get things done. That's the job. All you're gonna do is just support everybody else. Everyone who's asked to be the camp lead has given up in one month. Um, despite the fact that I don't do a hard role. I don't have a lot of emails going around. I do two to three work days. I make our, uh, our you know, um, application in about a day. That's the work for my camp. That's pretty much it. But if you are power hungry in my camp, you are not going to get anything because there is no power. Um, and that keeps that away so that the higher up in the camp you are, as it were, it's just more help to the camp and that's all. And that keeps the sort of, I want to be bossy and in charge people. Really, there's, we're just not the camp for that. There is no place for that, so it works out pretty well. I do let all the other mini camp leads in my camp do whatever the hell they want. Like literally all I'm saying is, hey, yeah, uh, I need to know the size of your camp so I can do the placement application and I need to know what you guys are doing. But most of the other camps within my camp are like three to four people total. So that's a very small group. Any other burning desire? To, we have other questions. And go ahead. Oh, sorry. One more. The answer is uh, slowly and painfully. So, I, at the cost of about three burns uh, for myself, I never asked anybody to be a lead. So, especially early on when we were small, I was waiting for somebody to say, "How can I help?" And if nobody was asking, I didn't assign it to anybody. I just stayed in camp and did all the work. And it was painful and it was rough. And I don't know if it's right, but I don't believe that I can come up to somebody and say, you need to be in charge. So unless they want to do it, the longevity of that will die off fairly quickly. And after a few painful years, every year I got more and more. And what helped a lot with that is the questionnaire. Once I did it, I, there's two questions in the questionnaire that says, how involved do you want to be in camp from one to five? And then another question is, which departments do you want to be a part of? So I open a spreadsheet and I see a list of 30 people that put five and they want to do this and this and this. And another question that I ask is, what are you good at? Because some people want to do something, but then you see what they're good at and you realize, well, this has nothing to do with what they want to do. So you can suggest, well, I see you're really good at this. We have this department. Do you want to give it a shot? So there's a little bit of nudge, nudging, but once you... Um, 
contact each individual camper in your camp. Like he said, it's a family. It's not me and my girlfriend. It's these two individuals. Once every individual is forced to answer these questions, you realize who wants to do what. And if you don't speak with those people, sometimes they don't participate, not because they don't want to, but they didn't even know they had an option. If they're the plus one, they just know, oh, somebody's taking me to Burning Man. They don't realize what they can or can't do. Uh, that's it. Thanks, Lee. All right, we have uh, three minutes left, and we got a question right over here. Hi. Uh, uh, I'm known as Jeannie. I run a camp of 20 people, 25 people. Uh, it's a question almost for everybody. Find me after if, uh, if you have something to discuss. Uh, I went to Burning Man three years ago for the first time, and I thought this is an amazing place. I want to make it easy for people to come here and just see this. It's their option to come back or no, but I want to make it possible. Um, the last two years after that, I'm bringing camp to the playa, about 20, 25 people, and half of them are virgin almost every last two years, and this is part of my promise to let it, to make it easy for virgin people to come back. And then half of these people are from outside of the United States. We have a storage unit for them to keep their bike here so they don't throw it away. We make it easy for them to take everything to the playa. Uh, so the point and the challenge of my camp and my philosophy is I want to make it for other people to go to burn. Uh, a lot of this is stuff that if you are not um, um, if you are not uh, necessarily willing to uh, participate, well, we'll give you one more year. If you are virgin, we'll give you one more year. doesn't necessarily apply to me. Uh, I'm interested to hear any thought about how to bring these newcomers or people who are outside uh, in, the si in, the scale, in the smallest scale, not the scale of 150 people, um, and just make it easy for them. I would love to. I have that problem. Um which is not, no longer a problem, but we are extremely fragmented. Most of our campers, well, at least half are not even from the US, and the other half is not from California or Nevada. We only have about 20 members who are considered local within like 500 miles of the burn. So we had the same problem. I can't expect people who come from Germany, or I could, but it's wasteful, to go to Walmart, buy a bicycle, come to the burn, and then what do you do with it at the end? So we, very much employ economy of scale where everybody shares their fees for a centralized camp equipment program. So everybody in camp, out of a camp of 150 last year, we had four cars parked in camp. Almost everybody came in with the Burner Express. We sent a shipping container with everybody's bicycles and then we store it in Reno or off Playa. Um, and that makes it easy for people from far away to come to the burn. Now, for influential people, which I, I found this is very good for trying to find the right word, but for rich people to come to the playa, many of them are rich and they own corporations and they have a lot of influence in the outside world and they can't afford to come to your weekend meetings and they can't afford to come be a builder and show up on Wednesday before the playa. They can only afford to be there for four days. Many camps wouldn't allow that. I actually see this as a huge opportunity. I bring this very influential, powerful person into Burning Man. He comes on Wednesday, he leaves on Sunday. It's a very short time, and I get a lot of crap for that from many people. But if I can put a little bit of a burner into that person, they then go out to the real world and trickle it down to their company and to their sphere, and there's a lot of power in that. However, to those people who come and they have it easy because everything in camp is there for them when they show up with the Burner Express, um, I am very clear in our first sentence in the guide is uh, this camp is not made to make your burn easier. It's made to make your gifting easier. So if you come and everything is ready for you, great, but then you don't treat it like a party. Then you better be part of the gifting procedure. You're going to drive the art car. You're going to participate in our gifting meals. You're going to volunteer in camp. You're going to do your shifts. You're going to do whatever you have to do. Um, I'll take care of the rest, but you can't just come and get a free ride. So I don't expect all the campers to do the same, but everybody has to add value or they're out. Do we, do one more? So our camp is uh, 25 people. Um, we, we have our local people handling the important things that need to be done locally, like, you know, making sure the shelter is functional. For anybody who's from a farther away area so they can't do that, they know how much work everyone else is doing, and they're straight up told, you have to make an equal contribution before the event, and you have to make up for anything during the event. This has led to incredible creativity. 
we had uh, we had some of our um, Washington team built and shipped down our rocket ship library because we thought you know one person said yeah I want to do this library the other one said hey I'm a carpenter I'll take care of it it all flat packed he was able to take it down uh, from Washington um, we've had people say okay I'm I'm from uh, far away I'm gonna do a bunch of camp cleanup and I'm gonna also work more on setup and tear down than most other people to take care of that we had one group of people come down with a trash can full of duck fat chocolate chip cookies um, yeah that was a good year um, <laughs> point is as long as we say yeah everyone's supposed to do something do something it works out pretty well I actually consider my job as a theme camp lead is to build the stage on which others perform um, I consider Burning Man to be a giant stage on which everyone performs and no one is the audience um, and I make my camp part of that um, so yeah I, I build the stage and I say well you're not building the stage so do something awesome and the next thing I know I get a trash can full of cookies well, I'm sorry, Boy Scout, but we are out of time. They're about to send the hook up to pull us off stage. Actually, she's right here. Um, thank you to our speakers. Uh, please find them afterwards if you have more questions. We only scratch the surface, so thanks.